and a bunch of a-holes. to another episode of the G Show Podcast. I am G1, and this is the Geek Out, episode six. And if you don't know, you just heard one of the most awesome things to happen this year, period, and that is the Guardians Inferno track off of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I'm absolutely in love with it, and uh, we will be talking about that because Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 came out this past weekend. So we're going to get into that, but before we do, let me introduce you to the panel. Joining me once again, six weeks strong, we got my man C. Monty. Chris, what's up, brother? Rated champion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. And joining me also, my right hand on the G Show, G95, Matt. What's up, my brother? Oh, I, I can't be as loud as Chris. <laughs> it so, is too loud in spirit. It is too early for that bullshit. But um, yeah. that's not, it's never too early to geek my out. Mind. <laughs> it's never too early to geek out, so let's get right into it. We're, we're going to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy, but we're going to talk about that a little later. And um, just giving y'all a heads up, it's full tilt spoilers, so y'all have been warned. If you haven't seen the movie yet, which you should have, we're going into spoilers, but that's at the end of this episode. We're going to start off, though, talking about another comic book property, which this was supposed to be a topic last week, which was going to be something completely different from what it turned out to be. And that was Wonder Woman and the lack of, uh, um, the lack of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Help me out. Promotion. Promotion, yes. It's Sunday morning. I'm fried uh, from a crazy weekend of -of out-of-space bonanzas. The lack of promotion of Wonder Woman. That was going to be last week. Then all of a sudden, the promotion started kicking in. So we're not going to talk about that. What we're going to talk about is everything we've seen thus far. Now... At Guardians of the Galaxy, I got to see, a, you know, I guess the final trailer for Wonder Woman on the big screen. And I'm not enthused about this movie, but I will say, after seeing it on big screen, I got a little chill in me. And I'm like, you know what? I can't front. I kind of want to see it more than I did previously. It wasn't even on my anticipated list of 2017 movies. But now I'm kind of like, I'm, 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 I'm buying the Kool-Aid. I'm buying the Kool-Aid. I didn't make it yet. But I bought the Kool-Aid. So, Chris, let me ask you, man. Wonder Woman, what do you think of these latest, this this, this promotional bombardment, as, a, as if you will, from this past week? What do you think of all this? I mean, I do feel like, not necessarily that it wasn't being promoted as heavily. It's, it's a weird thing because people always see things from different angles and everything like that, like, It did feel weird to me on my side. Like, you know, you remember being in New York City when a movie was going to be big. There's posters for it everywhere. You couldn't walk down the block without seeing something. And especially if you went to Times Square, shit was like plastered all over the place. Right. And I have yet to really see as far as um, posters in the subways and everything go. I didn't really see much going on for Wonder Woman. So that felt a little weird to me because, you know, this is a big comic book property. And Wonder Woman is like one of the top three DC characters. And so, you know, there's Superman, Batman, and then there's Wonder Woman. Is how people kind of like, even people outside of the comic book field, like, you know, the more mainstream people and everything like that, at least know those characters. So it felt kind of weird to me that I wasn't seeing more posters. I can't really speak on the TV side. I don't really watch TV like that anymore. Everything I watch, I do through the internet. So I don't like see commercials and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't know how I believe it was being promoted on TV or even radio for that matter. Um, it did seem like it wasn't 
being maybe as promoted as much as other big blockbuster movies usually do get promoted. But it's also not like, you know, something like John Carter of Mars where you just didn't see anything for it anywhere. Unfortunate. That was a good movie. Yeah. Like with John Carter, like, you know, to look at movies like that who have these big budget movies, but you just don't see any promotion for it. That's kind of weird. So I feel like Wonder Woman was kind of like in a middle ground in there somewhere between where like John Carter of Mars was and, you know, something like Justice League or Guardians of the Galaxy or Avengers, something like that the way those kind of movies get promoted. I do feel that there was a little bit of an outcry about it. Well, I don't feel like there wasn't a little bit of an outcry about it. And I think that's why we're getting that bombardment over the last week, probably going to see a lot more going into June as the movie gets ready to be released. But it also kind of feels like it wasn't necessarily a problem. Like, people might not have known the release date, but people knew the movie was coming out. Like, everyone knows there's going to be a Wonder Woman. It's not like nobody ever heard of it at all. Um, I am looking forward to it probably more than I have been any of the other previous DC movies, except Man of Steel before I knew how, like, you know, that was going to turn out. I was heavy into, like, oh, yeah, we're going to get a new Superman. We're going to start doing the world building, and we're going to get a DC universe. And then, you know, that happened, and... Uh, man, um, Batman vs Superman happened and Suicide Squad happened and I kind of like you know losing favor with the DC Universe Wonder Woman's kind of winning me back on that this looks like because I'm not even really all that interested in Justice League to be honest from right. what I saw in the trailer Agreed. so Wonder Woman is the movie that's kind of winning me back and I'm looking forward to seeing it Matt me and you we had many a discussion last well the past week about the lack of promotion you said you saw a lot I was like mm-hmm. you live in a smaller market than I do and I haven't seen shit. Then all of a sudden, I said the magic words. I haven't seen shit. And then shit started finding its way to my eyeballs. So tell me, man. I ate my words there. Um, the promotion that we've been getting. What are your thoughts? Um, I haven't really been keeping up with it. Aside from, you know, seeing, seeing like sponsored trailers and stuff pop up on Facebook. Or, um, you know... Stuff like that. I don't. I don't really watch the TV spots, uh, and at a, at a certain point, I just stop watching the trailers. Just to, you know, because the more the trailers come out, the more spoiler the spoiler e they get, um, and you know, I'm not about that. Nah. <clears throat> so, uh, as, you know, aside from seeing like, you know, I sent you that that poster that I saw on Instagram and stuff like that, and um, you know, I, I just see kind of like the oddball stuff or like that that big uh, theater giveaway thing they're doing. Um, that's the kind of promotion that I see, but it definitely has seemed to have ramped up in the last couple of weeks. I've been seeing stuff with a lot more frequency. Um, and I mean, I don't, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. It just seems like, you know, maybe they, they were a little late with it to start building as much hype as they're trying to build, but it also seems like it's uh, it's not being hammered into us. Like, the, the marketing isn't being hammered into us like um, BVS or even Suicide Squad was. And there, it's, it's definitely a much more, like, relaxed kind of marketing because I think that's what they're expecting. But I don't think they're, like... Besides for, you know, a handful of uh, the cast members, it's not like... An, a-list cast it's not you know it's it's not quite as big as bbs or suicide squad was so i think that's why they're being a little bit more um relaxed with it so let me ask you this then uh you you would think i mean granted (laughs) bbs made a buttload of money but it didn't make what they anticipated it to make and the critic reviews and even uh, most of the fans were kind of like what the hell is this I mean, you got yeah. your DC fanatics who were just like, fuck Marvel, this is the greatest thing ever. That, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, kind of compare it to what's going on in our society today where there's certain people who are just like, well, fuck it, I'm already involved, I'm in. But, that politics aside, Suicide Squad won a fucking Academy Award. <laughs> and, I mean, so it's got that. Mm-hmm. But, you, you know... When you think Warner Brothers and DC would try to be really, like, ramming it home because they want to try to change the perception of this universe that they're building, starting here, I mean, to to echo what Chris said, 
we've seen the, the Justice League trailer. Personally, I wasn't really that enthused about it either. I, I really wasn't impressed. It looks a little bit, you know, loftier than BVS was when those trailers dropped. But that was because of this outcry of, why is everything got to be so super serious? And, and it, it comes off a tad goofy. When, when they want to try to promote this, because the comedy beats in the trailers that I've seen so far for Wonder Woman don't come off as goofy as, let's say, the Justice League trailer did. So you don't, you don't think that maybe instead of being lax about it, they should be like full front, you know, full court press with this shit, especially if this movie's less than a month away. Um, no, I don't, I don't necessarily think so. I think, I don't know, maybe I can't, uh, articulate quite what I mean exactly, but, uh, I just think, you know, they're doing a, a good job with, uh, with us. It's not being hammered into us. It's not being like, you know, it's not going to be the movie of the year. Like, um, BBS was supposed to be, or then suicide squad was supposed to be. Um, you know, it's just, it's a DC movie. They're, you know, it's a, it's a world building movie. It's an origin story. It's not, it takes place in fucking world war one. It's not, um, anything like, obviously it's a, it's a very big budget movie and they wanted to do well, but I don't think they're, I think they've kind of have more of like in a better perception of what this movie is supposed to do money wise. And uh, I think they're kind of that's reflecting in the marketing a bit, mm. you know. Because if they if they were anticipating this to be the movie of the year, they'd be, you know, you know, they'd be hammering it into us more. But they're not, so I think they're just kind of expecting it to be, you know, it's gonna it's gonna make money, it's gonna do well, I think, because uh, you know any superhero movie is gonna do well no matter if it's good or absolute terrible, like absolute shit, but. Um, I think they just have their perception perceptions in check, and they I think they know kind of what it's gonna do. If that makes any sense? It makes sense. I got what you're saying, especially when Justice League comes out at the end of the year. That is the big movie. That is their event movie of the year. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I mean, because we already got for me, there was more marketing for Justice League, a movie that doesn't come out until November, than there was for Wonder Woman up until this you know past week. Chris, anything you want to touch on? Oh, yeah, I mean, like, I get everything that Matt's saying, and I guess, you know, from a business standpoint, I kind of understand it. Like, they're not really using this as something to make a huge... But, like, I also understand that side of things, well, why people are complaining about it then, because it's like, you know, <clears throat> this is supposed to be... I know I'm trying to turn this into a political thing, but this, I'm, I'm just explaining it from what the angle is. Like, this is supposed to be the first movie with like a female-led superhero not just like you know female-led action but like a female-led superhero and i can see why people are feeling like you know it's like why can't this get more shine why aren't they trying to promote this why aren't they trying to make this into a bigger thing because we need more stuff like this for young girls who are trying to get in the comic books and stuff like that so i see that side of it too like I understand this isn't supposed to be the big event movie of the year and everything like that, but they should still be trying to, like, push it and make, like, you know, this is a new thing. We should start getting used to the idea of female superheroes being in the forefront. So I see where I see where um, people are coming from when they make that complaint. And I understand it, and, you know, there's validity to it. I, you know, agree with that standpoint to to an extent and everything like that. Like, you know, you got to make bit smart business decisions, but you also have to respect the culture as well and start directing the culture. Yeah. So, I mean, I see both sides of it is basically what I'm saying. I'm trying, I'm taking the politician's way out. I see both sides. I see both sides. I agree with both points of view. And that's where I'm at. Well, we we got less than a month before we get to see this movie. Wonder Woman drops June 2nd. Can't wait. Jumping off of Wonder Woman and onto another superhero property, a group going into the silver, the, the the small screen. We got the Defenders trailer that dropped this week, and I don't care what anybody says. There was my man Iron Fist, best Netflix show ever. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, that was a joke, everybody. I do enjoy Iron Fist a lot, but it's Daredevil season two is still the best. Um, but okay, 
We see this trailer now. We get a full minute and some change. We saw Electra, you know, coming out of the hand cocoon thing. I love that. Oh, I was getting all geeked out and excited and shit. I was like, yes. And of course, you know, uh, I was a little pissed off. I can't lie. Because as much as I love Luke Cage and as much as I love Rosaria Dawson's character, I keep forgetting her name. I don't know why I keep forgetting her name. Claire, Claire they shouldn't have done it. Just stop. Luke Cage, you're supposed to be with Jessica Jones. Come on, man. Um, well, we don't know where the show's going to go from there. Though. We we know. We absolutely know. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I didn't want to see Clay and Luke Cage hook up. Luke Cage is a pimp in every sense of the word. If you don't know, just look at his show. That dude was in everything. But, um, okay. <laughs> so, the trailer dropped. I'm totally excited about it. I super geeked out about it. Um, Matt, you seen the trailer. What was your thoughts? I loved it. Um, been, I mean, it's been a long time coming. We've been waiting for this. And I guess we just gotta we gotta push through and we gotta wait a little bit longer. But yeah, I'm I'm excited. Um, just the dynamic between the characters, you know, they're what little we saw so far has been great, and I loved it. And it was it was funny, but I can tell they're gonna kick a lot of ass together. And you know, hopefully this will be a better representation of Iron Fist, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Damn you. <laughs> and with all these other great characters, I think Jessica Jones will be a little bit more tolerable because I fucking hated that show. But that's <sighs> neither here nor there. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm I'm excited to see Luke Cage and uh, Daredevil kick some ass because, I mean, the fight scenes in Daredevil are, you know, really good. Amazing. It goes without saying, but Luke Cage has been my favorite character and favorite sh show of the four so far. Luke Cage absolutely had the best soundtrack on Netflix. Unbelievably insane. I love that damn thing. Luke Cage was free. That, that shit was fun. I can't mm -hmm. lie. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed seeing Harlem. I enjoyed seeing New York in general. Just, it, oh, you know, being out here in Vegas for now almost four years in a couple of days. Some things you miss, and, and Luke Cage really brought that home. Chris, you don't have a problem with that. You live in New York. You walk the streets all the time. You don't get to see these superheroes, but you are one yourself. What did you think of this Defenders trailer? Yo, like, I wasn't ready for it. Like, when my, because I didn't know it was going to drown up. So my boy first told me, came out, I, was like, I, was, I was not prepared for how cool this shit was going to be. Like, I know Defenders is going to be awesome when you get these things all together, but I was not prepared. Like, with the with the Nirvana playing suddenly in the background and everything like that, and <laughs> just the way these characters are interacting, and it does seem like some of the reads that I got from Iron Fist and it does seems like he's easing more into the role now. And I'm expecting the the fight sequences to be better because my understanding is that this show has the same choreography team as the first two seasons of Daredevil, it's so better. hopefully you know that'll that'll step up Iron Fist's fight. <sighs> fight choreography and everything like that, and we'll be able to see Finn Jones kind of ease into that role a little bit better. And hopefully, you know, it'll make up for what happened in season one of Iron Fist. Stop the hate, um, you two. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this show. I'm really... I'm especially... Because they did seem to kind of, like, focus a bit on Luke Cage interacting with Iron Fist. Like, there's a couple of scenes in that trailer where they show them interacting. I'm like, yes, I can't wait for the full-on bromance the the the. The so, heroes for hire, baby. I'm so looking forward to it. Um, I like to see the intro scene where Jessica Jones is being interrogated and Matt Murdock just walks in like, yo, shut up, shut up, yes. stop talking. I'm your lawyer. I thought that that scene was interesting to me too because like for Misty to be reading her, the riot act about that, it's like, yo, isn't, didn't you get someone killed too for not doing things right? Like, shut the fuck up. But that's neither here nor there. We'll, we'll get into that when the actual show comes out. But man... Oh man, this looks amazing. I'm so looking forward to this show. Oh, more than anything else that's coming out with Marvel for the for, I mean, well, no, I can't say that because Thor Ragnarok is gonna be fucking amazing. So I can't say yeah. that. Yeah. But I'm just so hyped. I'm so hyped with what Marvel is doing. And I really hope that the comments that Kevin Feige made earlier this week about like the possibility of these things starting to intersect a little bit more. I hope they really do get into that. Cause they've been saying that for years, and that, that was supposed to be the whole point of doing the TV shows in the first place was to broaden the, the scope of the cinematic universe and bring all these things together. I really hope they start getting on top of that because like 
these things should be interacting more. Like, you know, Luke Cage ended with um, Diamondback and Luke Cage having this big old brawl in the middle of Harlem with everybody with their cell phones filming it. That shit should have been brought up on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. at some point. At least Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Like, yo, did you guys see these two superpowered people beating the shit out of each other in Harlem? Like, I just really hope they start moving forward with it. And this is going to be amazing, and it's a great time to be a geek, man. It absolutely is. Make mine Marvel television, seriously. And you know, I'm, I'm just looking forward to, uh, just give me a scene with Daredevil and, and Iron Fist spar. I just, I just, I just want to see it. I just, come on. Because everything Daredevil has done in season one and two, as far as fights go, has been... Yeah, yeah, I've never seen anything like that before. Not since like the first Matrix when Keanu Reeves was like showing off his black, his legit black belt skills, and and yeah. and even in John Wick. But did, I, I just want to see some real cool kung fu karate action, like karate versus kung fu. It's so good. I'm geeking out. Stop. Let me stop. And of course, Heroes for Hire and Misty Knight. And yes, stop. Okay. Um, something Marvel also put out for <laughs> the small screen that did not actually hit for me, was they released a very, very short teaser, audio only, of the Inhumans. But before they did that, they showed us a cast photo. We got to see Black Bolt in costume. We got to see Medusa in costume. We got to see the rest of the supporting cast in costume. But we didn't get to see the dog, whose name is slipping me right now. It pisses me off. But, lock joke. But this did absolutely zero for me zero not because of what they put out it's just the looks I, like oh god medusa looked terrible i just didn't like her face her jaw was like batman the animated series square i'm like i i don't know i i'm not excited for this nothing i've seen the little audio tidbit that they show with the the inhumans poster did zero for me i'm Nothing has gotten I me. Mean, I, I rather watch Agents of Shield, and I, I really don't like that show whatsoever. But I'd rather watch Agents of Shield than watch anything this in humans because it did nothing for me. So, uh, Chris, what about you, man? What you think of this? Yeah, I mean, it's fair. Like, I am kind of building anticipation for the show, but it's more it's more based on what I'm reading about the background information than it is the promotional materials. Like, the promotional materials aren't really doing it for me. Like you said, like you know, that little audio teaser. They didn't need to do that. They could have waited a little bit more so they had some footage and everything like that, something to actually show us and kind of like wet our palates and wet our appetites with that. Yep. Um, that photo wasn't really impressive. Like, I have to think, because you know, like, they were in a studio all day shoot. Like, that was really the best photo that came out of that shoot. <laughs> like, word. Like, promotion and everything like that. Like, that was the best one you had. If that was the best photo that that photographer was able to get, then fire that photographer. All due respect, I'm not trying to take work away from them, but for nobody or anything like that. But that was that was a bad promotional image. What's really selling me on this is, for starters, Erwin Rowan, who um, was from Misfits, and he also played um, Ramsey Bolton on Game of Thrones. Yep, I really I really like that actor. He's really he's a really you know great actor, and um. The rest of them I'm not really all that familiar with, but I am intrigued by the fact that Anson Mount, the guy from Hell on Wheels, who's playing um, Black Bolt, yep. just said, like, you know, they're, deal they're trying to deal with the whole thing about that Black Bolt can't speak. So he's developing a new form of sign language. Right. Because it's essentially like saying, like, he can't use American Sign Language because Black Bolt's not from Earth. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't know anything about American Sign Language. So they're actually developing an entirely new form of sign language scratch from scratch just for this i'm like that's that's impressive to me you know that shows like you're really taking this stuff seriously so that's those are the little details that are kind of intriguing me and drawing me and wanting to find out and then you know i'm i'm probably actually going to go to the the imax teaser thing they do in september like when they release the first episode in imax i probably might actually check that out well because these little details are kind of pulling me in well if i was still living in new york and you sent me an invite to that i respectfully decline Matt, what about you? It's like you declined the Logan invite that I didn't send you? That's right, declined the Logan, because you don't need to see Logan in black and white. I, I, I mean, I get it, I get it, but like, <laughs> I don't understand it. When they did it for Mad Max, I didn't understand it. The color palette is there for a fucking reason. It enhanced the movie. Why take it away? Uh, honestly, why take it away? The best watch black and white movie... Black, watch Mad Max in black and white and change your mind, I guarantee you. I, I, I doubt it very highly. I, there, there's something about that sequence when they're going into the storm, the colors of the storm... 
It's mind blowing. I love it. But we're not talking about Lloyd. You're supposed to see blood. You're supposed to see red. <laughs> yeah, I don't care. You're supposed to see red. Logan is supposed to be in color. Matt, what are your thoughts on Medusa and the Inhumans? Uh, I don't know. I don't really know a whole lot about the Inhumans. Um, and I haven't really followed much news about the show, but I did see that cast photo and just. I guess my only comment would be it just it just looks cheap. This looks really it looks like a like a knockoff kind of. It doesn't even look like, you know, anything Marvel would ever put out. It seems like some kind of like almost like um a uh you your shark name though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I'm trying to remember their the the studio Asylum? Name. Asylum, yeah. Like, it looks like an Asylum parody of <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy meets the Avengers, and it just, yeah, it just looks cheap and bad. And, but, you know, maybe maybe once the show comes out, it'll it'll change everybody's mind, but so far, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. Yeah, yeah you, it, it's funny. Yeah, it's strong with this because, like, First of all, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has already been dealing with the whole Inhumans thing for like the last three seasons. Yeah, exactly. So they're going to have to bring something to the table to set that apart from what's already been going on. Which, and which is, creates, for me personally, I, how do you work around that? They're going to have to. I mean, because I think Inhumans and S.H.I.E.L.D. is probably going to be the most closely connected, uh, as far as television goes, outside of Netflix. Netflix, we already getting to defend this. That's already there. But it makes Matt makes a good point, you know. It does look like a, a, a really low budget thing, and then they're putting the first two episodes in IMAX. What the fuck? Like that's that's crazy. I don't know. Uh, all I know is I'm not excited. I do like the idea of them creating a new sign language thing, though. That's 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 pretty interesting. But outside of that, I'm not on board. Just yeah, like it's weird because this was supposed to be a movie. I, I know, but. Like, we were supposed to get an Inhumans movie, and then all of a sudden, it's like, we're going to do a TV. It's almost like Marvel doesn't really believe in the property. But at that point, just let them do the Inhumans and Agents of Sealed and it drop. You know, I know people want to see the royal family, but if you're really not going to, like, go all well, out for it... Then... Exactly. That's And that's that's one of my things, too, with, with the whole Inhumans property. I am I take nothing away from people who are fans of that, and they have, you know, a fan base... I just never looked at the Inhumans like that because up until recently, up until the Marvel movies and and the, the the split between movies and comic books, when they started to get rid of the X-Men and shit and getting rid of the Fantastic Four in the comic book world and then making the Inhumans like the dominant mutant quote-unquote species, man, that's shady and shiesty, especially when you have so much history with the X-Men, you know? So I, I kind of like, you know, I look at them funny. I did enjoy him in Civil War 2 when I read it, but I didn't enjoy Civil War 2. This is a comic book topic, way off subject. Jumping off the same way somebody got knocked off, and I'm talking about Neil Blomkamp. <sighs> know, just one, one last thing I want to add about the Inhumans thing before. It's like it feels to me like what's going on now is because the whole push for it, because you touched on it, like the whole push for Inhumans came out of the rivalry with Fox, where Fox was doing, that owned all the rights to X-Men and everything like that. And I forget the name of the dude, but there was someone specific to Marvel that was basically saying, if it's not one of our properties, we're not promoting it within the cinematic universe. Yeah, that was like the comic CEO. Humans as the Marvel Cinematic Universe response to X-Men, since they can't use the X-Men. But now you see in the Marvel comics and everything like that, they're starting to bring the Fantastic Four back. They're starting to bring the X-Men back. So it seems like a lot of that black, bad blood is starting to die out. And the, the Inhumans property within the context of the cinematic universe is kind of suffering for that because it's kind of like we're not really going to make this a uh, push for this to make it a rivalry with X-Men anymore. The truth meaning behind that, though, because I follow this a lot, is uh, their sales started plummeting. People started beefing. You keep changing, changing, changing the comics. You're making new number one. They're all going back after the Secret Empire, which I'm almost I'm almost caught up to. I got like three more issues of Cap to read and then I'm diving into Secret Empire. But yeah, it was the, the sales. They, they need to go back to the status quo. That's why they Let's bring it all back. But yeah, yeah. speaking again, who's not coming back? Neil Blancamp. Now, <clears throat> Matt and myself about a year ago had this conversation on a spotlight, if I'm not mistaken, about Neil Blancamp's Alien 5 and how I said it's going to happen. And he said it's not going to happen. 
And I said, it is going to happen and you'll, re you'll rue the day you denied. And it's not happening. <laughs> so guess who's ruined the day? <laughs> this guy right here. I totally fucking misspoken. Miss I was totally out of my league because Ridley Scott apparently runs the alien universe. Uh, to say I'm disappointment, disappointed is an understatement. I was really looking forward to what Neil Blomkamp could have brought to the Alien franchise. And I honestly believe it could have existed alongside whatever Ridley Scott wants to do and however many movies he wants to do. Because Ridley Scott is not going past Alien. He's leading up to Alien. And that is fine and dandy. But it's official. Alien 5 from Neil Blomkamp is not happening, and Matt, go ahead, have your day. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I read a while ago that both Ridley Scott and Neil Blomkamp said that it was put on the, like, you know, it was put on the back burner, so um, Ridley Scott could work on what was then Prometheus 2 and then turned into Alien Covenant. And then he's like, well, now I want to do more movies. And then, you know, then we got the word that um, Alien 5 was shelved indefinitely. And, you know, if you know any kind of studio lingo at all, um, you know that shelved indefinitely means it's dead in the water. And it's not coming back. And it's kind of just, it's like an abandoned project. And that's like, yep, you know, fans can hope and pray all they want, but it's, you know, we're not going to get it. And, you know, now... Just this past week, he made it official, and I'm overall kind of okay with it. Like, I like Neil Blomkamp's movies. He's like, he's a he's a great eye for visuals, but he's like story wise is very hit and miss. And just because we we saw some really great concept art and no actual story beats for his idea for Alien Five. Um, doesn't mean it was going to be good. Like he had great concept art and he probably had a good idea. You know, we'll never know what that idea was going to be, but I also don't need the alien franchise turned into a allegory for race relations in South Africa. <laughs> so that's just me. So I'm, I'm kind of okay with it. Like it would have been cool to see what would happen. And, you know, maybe somewhere down the line we'll get, some kind of res resolution to Ripley's story. Uh, some real resolution. I don't care what anybody says. I actually really enjoy Alien Resurrection, but that's just, you know, that's another topic, another, maybe a, another spotlight. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of okay with it. I feel like her story was finished, you know. Alien <laughs> 3 happened, and as shitty as the movie that, as that was, we got a definitive death for... Um, Hicks, and I don't know. I'm I'm all right with it. I don't I don't particularly mind. I was looking for the retcon of Alien Three and Resurrection. I like Resurrection for what it is, but I hate it for what it's supposed to be. And I just don't like Alien Three. So, Chris, man, you seen the news? Your thoughts? I mean, yeah, it's definitely like you could definitely tell this was. Almost kind of like a power play from Millie Scott. Like, this is my franchise. I want to do more movies. And the studio is just like, all right, sorry, Neil. I mean, like Matt said, like, Neil Blomkamp is definitely a promising director in terms of, like, you know, I'm really, I was really looking forward to see where he would go in terms of creating more sci fi franchises. Because I really did dig um, District 9. Yeah. Chappie, not so much. Elysium was probably somewhere in between the two where it's like not bad but could have been better um and I get the statement like you know I don't like yeah I don't need to see Alien franchise into an allegory for race relations in South Africa but I'm also really not looking forward to Ridley Scott starting to turn the Alien franchise into an allegory for finding Jesus either yeah. like the more I'm reading about Covenant the more it's starting to sound like this really is a straight up Prometheus 2 and I hated Prometheus I wanted to see an alien movie. I didn't want to see, oh, we got to find our creator and our maker and everything like that. That's not alien. Xenomorphs are aliens. You know, finding out what happened to the engineer on when they, you know, in the first alien, when they go there and you see the big engineer space suit and the chest burst out and everything like that. It's an intriguing concept, but I'm really not <clears throat> looking for like this kind of pseudo philosophical stuff in my sci-fi horror. It's like, you know, 
like those old Reese's commercials. You got peanut butter in my chocolate. You got chocolate in my peanut butter. Hooray. You got pseudo, you got pseudo philosophy in my uh, sci-fi horror. Get that shit away from me. Like, I'm not enthused about it. If, you know, the, and the trailers were kind of pitching this as like a straight up alien movie. Like, we're going to see the xenomorphs. And I was so looking forward to that. But now the more I read about it, it's like that's going to be taking a back seat to the whole broader philosophy about, you know, connecting with God and everything like that. And I really don't want to see that in the Alien franchise. It's not what I'm, that's not what I signed in for that franchise for. Now, if you want to do an entirely new sci-fi franchise that explores that theme, I'm all there with you. I'll, I'll check it out and I'll see you go with that. But trying to force it into this other thing, I'm not really a fan. Yeah, I'll hear you on that one. So I, I mean, yeah, I was interested to see what Neil Blanc came out of done with it. Um, but it just kind of sounds like on this end, either way, we'd wind up with a movie that I probably wouldn't have been as found as enjoyable as the original two. Well, Matt, anything? No? Um, well, all I can do is try to defend it because this is, you know, the, the big movie of the month for me. It was... Right. I was more excited for, for this than Guardians of the Galaxy 2, than Pirates of the Caribbean, and Wonder Woman, and all that shit. Um, this is, I like, Alien is one of those franchises that's very near and dear to me. And I, I like Chris, I didn't really dig Prometheus the first few times I watched it, but then I watched it a few weeks ago, just, you know, refresh stuff for uh, Covenant, and... You know, I, I really did find myself enjoying it this time around. Um, <clears throat> and from what I've heard, which hasn't been much, um, they do start to answer some of the the open-ended questions that Damon Lindelof loves to put in his his work, which is a huge reason why I think he's a terrible writer. <laughs> um, but, <clears throat> you know, I think it's... From also from what I've read of the reviews, it's very much an alien movie. Um, you know, hence why it's called Alien, not Prometheus Two. But that is going to be that that balance where we do get resolution from the lack of answers of Prometheus and slowly lead into a more classic Alien tale. So, with I think with what um, Ridley Scott has planned, if these movies do get made. We're going to see each one getting progressively closer and closer to a typical alien story. I mean, given that he wants them to to lead into alien, uh, I, I should hope so. But I, you know, I dig that kind of philosophy stuff, um, especially in sci-fi. I think it was a smart move to take those kind of bigger questions and put them in a separate movie, which was Prometheus that just had ties to the alien world. And, you know, I think having sequels kind of fix those things or answer questions and build upon the the universe and um, get closer to what we all know and love about the franchise is a smart move. But, you know, I can also totally understand why somebody wouldn't be into that. Mm. It's, It's a thing that's definitely not for everybody. You see, I, I'm, I'm happy that I don't go into these movies and look at things like that. That's crazy. Um, well, you know, I, I never seriously sat back and thought about the philosophical message you're trying to put across. I'm just there for the ride. That's what I go into these movies for. I'm just there for the ride. And, you know, uh, while for me, I enjoyed Prometheus the first time I saw it, but I think it was just the, I was overhyped for it. And then as I watched it again a couple times on TV, okay, all right, yeah, it's okay. It's one of those movies, it's, and I never <coughs> owned it. So certain movies, especially in a franchise like this, I own those movies. I should own those movies, but Prometheus is just either I, I've never gotten around to it. There was never a good sale to get it. I don't. I don't know. But um, I am looking forward to Covenant. I'm not looking at anything. I, I, I'm staying away. Like I told you, Matt. I'm staying away from reviews. I'm, I don't really want to know. This is one of those movies I want to go in without pretty much know any type of plot details other than what I saw in the trailer. Just because I don't want to go in with any preconceived notions. I just want to go in and enjoy, you know, this follow up to Prometheus, but now finally getting a full fledged fucking xenomorph. Like, I'm, yes, here we go. This is the franchise I want. This is what I want to see. Alien or aliens wreaking havoc 
to, you know, a stranded bunch of survivors. And and plus, it's kind of crazy. This girl is a freaking magician. She should, you know, she's she's a she's a wizard. She's a, not a muggle. She should just <laughs> call her friend and add the xenomorph to her his freaking sequel book. Fantastic book. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic beast. <laughs> What's wrong with her? Where's a wand? I don't understand. Why she got to look like Ripley? The, the, these are the questions I want answered. The, these are the things I don't want. Like, I get Ripley. The, the aesthetic's the same, but you don't have to beat me in the head with that. I, I that. That's just a little t- a little nitpick I have there. Anyhow, I mean, if it's any consolation to either of you, um, years and years ago, before this movie was an active production, they were talking about trying to get uh, bring Ripley into the prequel series, I guess, or the Prometheus sub franchise um, via time travel. So you know, no matter what we get with Alien Covenant, whether we love it or we hate it or we're spoiled by <laughs> it it whether or not what we get is good or bad it could have been so much fun, couldn't worse with getting yeah. ripley via time travel listen time travel only works in one movie and that is star trek for the voyage home <laughs> no you know i'm lying of course honestly obviously i mean i mean like you know i don't want to make i don't want people walk away from this podcast thinking that i'm gonna think alien covenant sucks and i'm not have i have no interest in I'm definitely going to check it out. And maybe the balance would be better between the sci-fi horror and the, the philosophical stuff with Damon Lindelof out of the picture. Maybe that was the big thing that made me hate Prometheus. I hate, like Matt said, I hate Damon Lindelof's style of writing where he just throws up a bunch of questions and be like, oh, look at how smart I am because I'm asking these questions. Like, look how smart you're not because you never figure out a way to answer them in your own movie. Which which kind of makes me you sit <clears throat> back, take a step back and think about something real quick, Matt, because you say that and I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. I don't really like that. Yet, you over here defend Shin Godzilla all the fucking time and that, that is the biggest open ending of all time. It's like, this movie's stupid. <laughs> so, I mean, come on, brother. That's, that's I'll see two you. different things, I think. I'll see you. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. It, the the open ended question thing works in certain mediums. Um, anime is a really good example of that, where you can have these kind of questions, um, and I think it worked totally with the mystery of Shin Godzilla and stuff. But it didn't work for Prometheus because the point of Prometheus was these people going to this other planet to find answers. <laughs> they just they they the two people that left that planet left with more questions, mm-hmm. and I think that's that's where it kind of gets off and you know, to be a little bit fucky. And that's what Lindelof is notorious for and famous for, and that's you know maybe that yeah. was the big thing that put me off Prometheus, and maybe this time around with a writer that understands what the uh, want, audience wants more, you know I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. I'm definitely walking into there with an open mind. I just, you know, from the reviews I was reading where they were making it seem more like another Prometheus, I was just like, I didn't have a good experience with that, so. I mean, I haven't read any reviews, so but I've just seen headlines, yeah. and all the headlines I've seen have said, it seemed like they were, like, saying really positive things about the movie, um, and that it was, like, a very much an alien-driven movie but i'm not going to actually read any reviews i'm done watching the tv spots and stuff whatever i see on my timeline i'm just going to kind of i'll read the headline or whatever unless it's spoilery and but that's that's just what i do you know like at a certain point i just kind of cut off and then i'm just going to wait for the movie because it comes out in like what a week two weeks yeah Yeah. yeah something like that so you know i can i can wait i whether those reviews are good or bad, um, I'm excited to see it. All right. Well, skipping over certain things for time, I because I, I want to do we do I do want to talk Guardians, but before that, let me jump into to Batman because it's Batman. So a movie that's not coming out in two weeks, a movie that's coming out in two years, maybe three, uh, is Batman the Batman, whatever you want to call it. And uh, the other day, I just want to ask you guys what your take on this. The other day. Josh Gad, you guys know him as uh, LeFou, or whatever his name is, right? That's his name in Beauty and the Beast. He's Olaf from Frozen. Uh, LeFou. LeFou, right? Olaf from Frozen. Josh Gad. 
The guy, the funny guy that, that tried and tried to get Daisy Ridley to spill the beans about The Last Jedi? He put up on Twitter a picture of the penguin. Him as the penguin. Now, do you think that this dude is coming to Gotham? Uh, what, what, Matt, what do you think? Um, I don't know. Maybe he's kind of like trying to campaign for the role or say that he's in the running for a penguin kind of role. Um, but I don't know. It can mean a lot of things. Um, I think it's probably way too early to, to tell or even get any like real casting news like two or three years before the movie comes out. But then again, we did get Jason Momoa as cast as Aquaman. I saw a year before BBS even like started shooting. Right. So, you know, it could mean anything, but I don't really know a lot about the guy. I I've seen some of those Daisy Ridley videos. I watched him, you know, host host the Star Wars panels and stuff. I never saw Frozen, didn't see Beauty and the Beast. Just not a Disney guy, but um, I don't know. I could see it. Well, Chris, Chris, I can see it. Chris, you think it's an inspired choice? Um, I'm still playing, like Matt said, I'm still wait, playing the wait and see game because I, you know, on a couple of forums that I go to and everything, someone mentioned, like, this could just be, like, for an animated movie. Like, he mm-hmm. could just be doing the voice of the Penguin in the animated movie. We don't know. Um, it's, I'm, yeah, I'm playing with this because, like, I like Josh Gad, but there's, like, this weird thing that they're doing in the DC movies now where they're playing, they're casting actors that are kind of against the type for the character. Like, Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor was a terrible choice. Terrible. <clears throat> um, was not a fan of Jared Leto as the Joker. I disagree. Uh, <laughs> I also disagree. I wasn't a um, This is like, it just seems like they're trying to, like, as in some of the villain roles, they're, they're casting actors who I wouldn't necessarily be my first choice. And Josh Gad would be good for, like, a goofy penguin, but I don't want a goofy penguin. I want, like, you know... I want a penguin that comes off more like Philip Seymour Hoffman did in Mission Impossible 3. Yeah, I, I like agree with that. Gangster, arms dealer, ruthless, vicious. Because that's that's the, the, the not, not necessarily what I saw in the cartoons coming up, but as I started to explore that character more and see like what's going on in the comics, that's kind of who the penguin is. He's like this vicious crime lord gun dealer. I, <clears throat> I, I mean, like, no disrespect to him. I don't know what his range is, but I just don't. From based on the roles that he's played before, I don't see Jan- Josh Gad pulling that off. See, I like what you said there. Be- I-, I like what you said there because <clears throat> I'm gonna give the dude the benefit of the doubt only because I've seen it happen with Jim Carrey. Like everybody just thought of Jim Carrey as the rubber faced man who makes people laugh, and then all of a sudden he did that really. I forgot the name of the movie, but that really like insane movie where he was like just this mental case. He was like a fucking scary dude. Same thing with Robin Williams. We always thought Robin Williams is Mork from Mork. Just this funny, funny comedian. And then he does, uh, what was it, something out with photo or some shit? Where he just plays this real dark character. And I feel, I feel personally that comedians are actually the best type of people or comedic actors are the best type of people to get that because I've I've, I've kind of seen it <laughs> like wow oh, shit they go to dark places sometimes they got to tell a joke that is they're going to take a chance to swing for the fence they got to think about really crazy things just to make you laugh so they they can get to this sinister place and I agree 100% with you Chris if he is playing the penguin I want to see the arms deal penguin I want to see that one the gangster and I think he I really do could pull that off. He has the look. He has the look. Even because he, he's he's slimmed down a lot from the. I remember the first time I seen him. Like my daughter was frozen all the time, so we used to watch these press releases and shit. He was a big dude. He slimmed down a lot, but he still fits the bill perfectly. No pun intended for the penguin. I mean, yeah, like I said, like I'm, I, you know, I'm not saying that he definitely can't pull it off and everything like that. It's just like from the trend of what I'm seeing. What's been going on in the DC universe right now? And Matt Reeves might be the one to do it, but like it's just like <clears throat> it has to be from a filmmaker who's willing to let him explore that kind of character, right? 
Because like when they cast when like uh, this is what I'm saying like when they cast Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor, it's because they wanted they had a very specific vision of what they wanted Lex Luthor to be, and that vision was wrong to me. <laughs> to a so, lot of people. If they're casting if they're casting Josh Gad because they want to play like a Josh Gad penguin, then I don't want that. If they're casting Josh Gad because they want him to push that boundary and let him explore the, that kind of character and everything, then I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, like you said, and give him a shot. So it's all about if he is being cast, if this isn't just like, you know, <clears throat> he's going to be featuring as a voice actor in an animated movie and they're actually legitimately looking at him as Penguin for the live-action DCEU, then it's all going to come down to what I start seeing. You know, I'm going to reserve judgment. Because we all have the same thing. A lot of people have the same thing when they said Heath Ledger's the Joker. And then like, everybody was all about, oh, broke back Joker and yeah. all this stuff. And oh, 10 things I hate about, like 10, 10 things I hate about Joker and all this stuff like that because of the movies that he had done previously. And then he, we started seeing the promotional materials and we saw what he did in the trailers and we were like, holy fuck, that was the Joker. That was the Joker. Like, yep. it was definitely the definitive Joker for like a generation. So we'll see. Like I said, I'll play the wait and see again. All right, well, let's get out of here. Let's get down to the nitty gritty of the podcast. The the thing I really, you know, really want to talk about. And that's what's for dinner tonight. No, I'm joking. It is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, the fucking movie where the critics are saying it's uneven. I don't get it. What's uneven even mean? I'm lost because to me, I've seen this movie three times now. I told you I've seen it last week in a special screening and I loved it. I've seen it Thursday night again and I've seen it yesterday with my wife and my daughter and I tell you, I don't know. I came out of it yesterday with, like, I, I just, each time I've seen it, I loved it even more. I, I got something more out of it. I don't know what it is. It could be that Guardians Inferno song. It could be, if you guys seen it, I don't know, you, you had to have peeped it. It could have been the Jeff Goldblum cameo at the end where he's dancing in the bubble. That's great. Things like, I mean, yes, we've unabashedly gushed about James Gunn, me and Matt, we have. And I think this movie right here, I mean, again, don't go into it thinking it's going to be better than Guardians 1. Some people might think that way. I don't. I love Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. But this movie is the perfect complement to that. It is the perfect complement. There's no Empire Strikes Back moment. There's no. You know, there's nothing that alters what this franchise is, is, is doing. That's going to be Infinity War. This movie, would, to me, was the perfect three to four issue comic book arc. A nice self-contained story that can be told in this many issues and wrapped up. Nothing left open. Everything was just a nice, neat package that was visually stunning, that was emotionally engaging, and, and God damn, I mean, like, the laughs just kept coming and coming and coming. So for me, personally... And that wasn't anything spoilerific. I'm going to leave the spoilers to you and just, you know, run off of that. But for me personally, this has definitely been my favorite Marvel movie since Civil War. I did not like uh, Doctor Strange at all. Um, but this is the right... For me, this is like such a, a springboard into what we're getting from Marvel this year. We're getting Spider-Man and then we're getting Thor. Fuck me sideways this shit is great gorgeous i absolutely loved it james gunn and company i love you guys chris take it away well I, all right chris i, I hate that damn song war. yo i love this movie you mentioned there's probably gonna be people walking away from this movie that liked it better than the original i'm one of those people oh wow okay i, love this movie. I really dug this movie more not to say, you know, obviously, because I love the original as well and everything like that, but to me, the first one felt like James Gunn kind of getting a feel for the source material. This one felt like a labor of love for him. Now, were there things that I didn't enjoy? To a degree, I felt like in maybe the first third of the movie, they went a little heavy with trying to work the soundtrack in and everything, like the whole mixtape thing. Yeah. You know, they would hit, that was, it almost felt, not it wasn't as sloppy as Suicide Squad, but it almost felt like the same way where like 
almost every story beat, they would try to attach a song to Ugh. that specific moment. Hated that. So they leaned a little heavy on that. That was one of the things. It got better throughout the movie. They they pulled back and everything, but that was one of the things that I kind of felt like first, maybe third of the movie, they could have done a little less with that. Um, I could have done without the subplot with the from the Sovereign because that would have been, like, give more time to explore other things, you know, like the stuff with the Ravagers, how Chris Pratt relates to, you know, exploring Eagle, the living planet a little bit more, which leads me to the third thing I didn't like is how you introduce such a fascinating character like Eagle, the living planet, kind of like twer- tweak his backstory to make him a celestial, and then you kill him off at the end of the movie. Ah, uh, that was great. Like, I get it. I hope they find a way to bring him back into the universe, though, because, like, I feel like we need more ego. That's that's an element that we need to explore more in terms of the cosmic side and everything. Let, let me stop you right there. It's not that we need more ego. We need more Kurt Russell in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Because let's yeah, not fucking. I was front. gonna get to that he point. Before kill you. this I was movie. <laughs> All right. Because <laughs> that was the thing. That was the that was the other thing that made me enjoy and appreciate this movie better than the first one was that Kurt Russell as ego was a much more intriguing and compelling vi- villain than Ronan was. Ronan, it was kind of like, eh, I don't really care. Like, oh, you know, the I'm a Kree and I hate I hate um, these guys and I'm going to destroy their planet because I... Like, Ego really was... There was charisma to him. You understood his motivation. Like, as a human being specifically, I kind of think, because that's, that's what's hardwired into us, is reproducing ourselves and spreading ourselves as, as much as possible. So I get where Ego was coming from with that. Like, I get his motivation. I understood it and I appreciated it. And everything like that. And again, he, Kurt Russell, charismatic and charming as fuck. You can't go wrong with him. Right. So I want to see more of him in that universe. Um, so like I said, I felt they could have done without the Sovereign because that just, it just felt like they only introduced them so you had that thing at the end where they come in and they're, fi- and they're fighting them while they're trying to fight Ego. But you could have just had, like, Ego be a more formidable villain. And you wouldn't have need the sovereign to be like to up the stakes or whatever like that. Like you're fighting an entire fucking planet. How much higher can the stakes get? Um, so those were the things I didn't appreciate. Those were the things that like I didn't hate, but it was like you know I kind of felt like I didn't really need that. Um, but I uh, outside of that, I loved this movie. I loved. I felt that it had more emotional beats, more emotional beats for me to connect to. The whole relationship between Yandu and. Um, Star-Lord. And Star Lord, yep. like, oh my God, that funeral scene at the end to me was save Yandu, some of that for save some, some of that for Matt. Trek. Save some of that. Huh? Save some of that spoiler shit for Matt. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm just saying, like, it's, for me emotionally, it was right up there with Spock's death in, in the Star Trek movie. Right. Like, that's how how much emotional weight it had to me. Um, it just like, oh. I'm I'm struggling to find the words to talk about how much I love this fucking movie, bro. Like, it was really you could tell it was a labor of love from James Gunn. I mean, he really found his his momentum with this franchise, and it's really selling me on the idea of him being kind of like the creative director going into. They don't not they're not calling it Phase Four, but like the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and everything like that because. He really does seem like he loves these franchises and he wants the best things for it. And this movie was just a representation for that. And I'm so looking forward to what he does moving, moving on and going into the future. I love this fucking movie, bro. Matt, what were your thoughts on Sylvester Stallone stealing the show? <laughs> <laughs> I think Kurt Russell is the one who stole the show, <laughs> Absolutely. as he always does. Um, Do you guys notice that like in the opening scene when he was on Earth with um, the with with with, uh, with the lady, he was basically dressed like Snake Plissken. Yep, he was. Yeah. You have the hair and you have the brown jacket and stuff. I I got a kick out of that. But uh, yeah, I I also just fucking love this movie. Um, I don't have any like overt complaints about it except. Maybe it felt like twenty minutes too long. I've heard that a lot too. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, I kind of was thinking, okay, this is where it ends. No, no. Okay, no, now this. No, oh, but there's still like there's still a while. Okay, um, that 
that was my only big complaint, but I've only seen it the one time so far. Um, but yeah, like the, the humor was great. The story I, I really got into, um, I, I felt it was, I had more of an emotional connection to this movie because, uh, just like I related to certain things in the movie a, a lot and they, it, it hit me pretty close to home. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, all the, all the actors that James Gunn always brings in are, are fantastic. Um, Kurt Russell, like I said, stole the show as he always does. He played the perfect balance. He has this, just in this incredible ability to be like very warm and charismatic and like kind of, you know, the fatherly figure. And then just at the drop of a hat, just switch to the most t- sinister, terrifying character. And I mean, case in point, like another good example of that is uh, Death Proof. You know, in the beginning, when we first see him, he's very charismatic and nice and just seems like a cool dude. And then he just switches into this fucking psycho. Um, and yeah, I just I thought it was a great movie. I, I enjoyed the stuff with the Sovereign, but that's because maybe I, I just have a thing for gold chicks. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just everything. It, it felt like a very well put together movie. I felt like everything moved together very seamlessly. I did like the stronger focus on um, Nebula because she would, to me, was the standout character in the first Guardians. So I like that they gave her a lot more screen time and a lot more depth to that character and stuff. Um, just, I think, you know, I don't, I don't want to compare the two. I don't want to say this one is better than the other or vice versa. Um, but I think it's just a good, con- solid continuation. You know, like, like you said, Ray, it's like a perfect compliment to the first one. It, it just, yeah, it was, it was a great movie. It really was, man. I cannot wait to get it. And I, you know what? I, I, I do agree with you, Chris. Yeah, it, it, it is a bummer that they, they had to kill Ego uh, because of Kurt Russell's amazing performance. I think we all we are all in agreement on that. It was, man, I'll tell you, I was I really was into Wendy. I loved your mother. I was like, God damn. That, the way him and Chris Pratt played off of each other was fucking phenomenal. I loved yeah. every minute of it. I bought into it. And I'm telling you, that yesterday, watching it again, I'm not lying. I was sitting there now because I know what's coming. Now I can absorb it all. And as I'm watching and absorbing all this, I'm getting emotional. I'm sitting there. I'm like, good thing I got my allergies in full gear. So my left eye is a little raw and ragged because of the allergies. I'm itching and I get this freaking tear coming out the, the side. And I'm like, you know what? I just blame the allergies. That's it. That's what's <laughs> going to happen. I don't care. You know, I'm sitting there with my soda. My soda's already gone. I'm like, fuck. And like Matt said, it is a little long. Watching it again for the third time, it really doesn't feel that long. Especially, I guess, because I really, really, like Chris, love this movie. So for me, it doesn't... It's just like I want to take in as much of this movie as possible. Just keep feeding me this story and the visuals and these characters and and takes fucking... Kurt Russell being Kurt Russell and fucking Yondu. Yondu. I think the only part that bothered me, and this is not a big thing, was when Yondu is talking to Rock and he says, I know all about you, boy. And he gets into his spiel because that was the only time it felt forced. It felt a bit forced. Everything yeah. else Yondu did in that, because he's in character, but everything else... Feels like, because Yandu feels like he's a forceful type person. Like, you know, he's, he's old headstrong. But that that one seems like, I know who you are, because you are me. And I, that was the only thing I was like, God, I, I wish it was delivered a bit different. But didn't take me out of the movie. We're already in space. So I was just, Yandu, man. And 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 I guess you know, Chris touched on it. Matt didn't go there. I will. It's a spoiler review. But Yandu's sacrifice at the end of that movie is that yesterday caught me more than it did the first two times. It caught me. It just got to me. And it was Chris Pratt when he's like, no, 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 no. Oh, man. I was sitting there because his father just died, right? But justifiably so. They had, he had to kill him because there's no way he's going to sacrifice his friends 
Tell the fat, but fuck that. You know, I want. But then he's when you come to that realization, my father was right there the whole fucking time. And he is saving my man, that shit hit me in places. I was like, oh, you know what I'm saying? The the yeah. mouth gets a little hot and watery, like this. I'm like, oh man. That to me, that man, that that put a dagger in my heart. It was beautiful. I and I, like you said, the funeral when the ravagers come back after Sylvester Stallone says, You're not gonna see the colors fly at your funeral. And they come out in force and they fly the colors. It was an absolutely beautiful fucking moment. Uh, I, in a movie chock full of just a great roller coaster ride with, with the humor, with the, the, the parts where you gotta feel. You brought up Nebula. Nebula, you wanted to win. I just wanted a sister. Wow. I was like, sh- 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 stop. Stop. Absolutely. I, I, I can't I can't gush about this movie anymore. I can't. Uh, I, I do want to say I agree with the, the soundtrack thing. Um, uh, Suicide Squad killed. I, I mean, me and Matt talked about this on our Suicide Squad review. The soundtrack killed me because as good as all of those fucking songs were, it was too much. And it wasn't, it wasn't organic. It wasn't organic. It, it was wasn't organic. It, it was a Guardians of the Galaxy did it. Let's try to up them. Ah, it didn't work that way, brother. Um, and that's why I was saying, like, in this one, in the first maybe third of the movie, it kind of felt similar to that. Where the, the songs were great, and they did fit the moments that they that they were putting them into. But it just seemed like they were saying, let's create moments where we could use these soundtracks and everything like that. As the movie progressed on, it did become more and more organic, and it didn't, like, you know, take me out as much, but... The first, the first maybe like 20, 30 minutes of the movie, I was like, okay, let's ease back. We know we got you got great songs on the soundtrack. Let's pull it back a little bit. What I dug about this too is that they used, and unlike the first Guardians, they used, I think, two of the same songs a couple of times, which to me was great. Like they used the um the song from right in the beginning when he's with uh when they're in the 80s, right? They used that again later on when he starts saying, you, me and you, we're the we're the sailor, we're, you know. And um, they use the song when they're going with him. They use that at the end when he, you know, when he finally gets up and he's like, he's like, I don't use my brain to control the arrow. I use my heart. And then the song kicks in and it's just like, yes. And we've had this conversation a couple weeks back with the Thor trailer. Music for me, if the music complements what I'm seeing, it's perfect. And for me, that was so perfect. And I'm with Matt. I dig the gold chicks too. I did. I like them a lot. And what really, really got me was the fact that their ships were drones and they were like basically in an arcade and you hear all these arcade sounds. And I was like, James Gunn, you're a fucking genius. I love that. Yeah, and I, I, I get that. I'm not, I'm not saying that I hated them. I'm just saying like, to me, that subplot kind of like pulled from the rest of what the actual story was. So I could have, like, I would have loved it if they were the villains in, like, maybe the third movie. Oh, they'll be, though. You see at the end, it's Warlock. Come on. Yeah. No, yeah, I, and I understand that. Like that. But what, what I'm saying is that, like, I would have loved it if they were, their, they were their own story or whatever like that. And it was just, like, the Guardians of the Galaxy versus the Sovereign and that was the movie. Yeah. But I just felt like they pulled away from the ego thing a little bit. Yeah. I'm not saying I hate them. I'm just saying, like, it kind of distracted from the focus of the actual story for me. I see what you're saying. For you, um, it was like a misplaced MacGuffin. Yeah. Exactly, gotcha. and um, just going back, like, like, like you guys have been saying, like, there's just so many emotional moments, but there's also so many great character moments. So, like, I, one of the things we haven't touched on is we haven't really touched on how great Dave Bautista has been doing his fucking drags, just hitting those fucking humorous beats nonstop. He's really getting into this character, and I love it because I don't watch wrestling. You know, I don't watch. I you you see my post on Facebook. I dig at people who watch wrestling. I like to troll. I love to troll. And you need to stop. So I'm not really, I'm not really <laughs> familiar with um, Dave Bautista as a person and everything like that. But like, it's always for me. Like, it's always been like as far as wrestlers who transition into movies. I felt like The Rock was the only one who had enough charisma to do it successfully. But now I'm starting to see that Dave Bautista was really up there on that level. Yeah. Like he's, you know, he's really passionate about this character. We know from the first one, he went out, he took acting lessons and everything like that to really dig into it. He really wants to bring something to this role beyond just being the big, tough guy who throws people around. 
and it's paying off in dividends, man, because he's na- he's fucking nailing it as Drax for me with what they're doing with the character. I agree, man. I love. This- okay. Okay. Chris. I love the subplot that they had with um, Rocket coming to terms with the idea that like he doesn't need to push people away, and it's okay for him to be friends with people and you know have a family, like. You know, I'm loving what they're doing with that character and everything. I just, I loved all the little emotional character moves and the little funny character moments. I loved there was that one scene where, like, when Star Lord and Yandu are coming down from the ship. Mary Poppins, yo! <laughs> you look like Mary Poppins. It's like, is he cool? And then he looks at him and he just like, has that moment. Where he's like, yeah, yeah, Mary Poppins is super cool. Like, he has that moment where he realizes who Yandu is to him. Gonna embarrass the dude. He doesn't want to like make him feel like an asshole. And he's like, "Yeah, Mary Poppins is really cool." I love and that he's like, part. Yeah, look at me, guys. I'm Mary Poppins. Like, I love it's that part. Such a great moment of how they relate to each other that really built, you know, really makes the final moment that much more significant to me. Yeah, Matt. What about you, man? Batista is definitely a standout. What, what were your thoughts on some of the cast outside of um, Kurt Russell? Oh yeah, uh, I wanted to say that you know Dave Batista like. Uh, besides Nebula, I think um, even more so than Nebula, I think um, Drax was like the character that was improved upon the most. Um, he was a lot more. I mean, he wasn't really more fleshed out. We didn't get like more insight into him as a character, really. But you know, he was just he was like consistently on point with the jokes and humor and just the 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 beats and like Drax humor might be my favorite kind of humor ever. It's just very loud and just fucking dumb. <laughs> Um, yeah, I thought the chick who played Mantis was really good, too. Yeah. Um, you know, that was kind of unexpected. I didn't even know who Mantis was, but I'm sold. I'm sold. I want to see more. Um, you know, like, yeah, yeah, as you know, Chris said, like, uh, Rocket was really expanded on in a great way. Um, Chris Pratt nailed it with the the daddy issue stuff um and like that that you know just shows that he's not just the the good looking joke machine kind of guy he's got some some depth to him to him and his acting acting skills um i guess the only one i feel like didn't go anywhere really or didn't get their character expanded on or pushed into new places was um Gamora like she kind of just stayed the same throughout the movie I mean yeah there was the stuff with her and Nebula but that was more like Nebula coming to her yeah and her kind of coming to terms with their whole relationship and stuff and um there probably could have been more room for a bit of a dynamic between them more than we got or because it seemed a little bit one-sided um but you know, that's that's nitpicky stuff. I'm I'm really satisfied with all the characters and what happened with them and where they went and stuff and all of you. Know, every I can't think of a single actor who did a bad job. You know, everybody was like really on point and like just on their game. Then it fit the movie perfectly. I totally agree with the Batista thing on both of both counts. I mean that. I, and the first, I won't lie, the first time I saw the movie, I was a little kind of like thrown off. I was getting like annoyed. He was uh, laughing at everything. I was like, I don't know. The second time I saw it, I was like, okay. When I saw it again yesterday, and I was like, you know what? Totally fits because he has that moment and it's an abundance in this movie. But then he has those smaller moments. For instance, when he's uh, when, when, right at the beginning when he has to go and he like goes out of the ship because the weapon systems are damaged. And he's, got, he's fighting that one sovereign ship in the asteroid field. He just walks by Nebula. She's about to grab the fruit. He kicks it. It's not right. But then, I mean, it wasn't like a joke. It was just like, don't eat that yet. Or when he's with, um, when they finally get to Ego, and he, he says, the, the, like, something about, along the lines of the beauty here has humbled me. Man! The delivery, because this is, you know, you've seen him nothing but laughing the entire time. That time. moment with Mantis, too. Like, with Mantis, yep. That's a, that, yeah, that comes later. It's just these, those moments that I didn't get on my first viewing because I was kind of taken out with the the constant laughing thing. Those moments really just, man, it, it, it just balanced 
everything out with that character for me. And and again, like, it just made me fall in love even more. Like, damn, this shit is good. Fuck. But, and Mantis, you're right. I love that character. And, and yeah, I agree. I think Gamora had the least amount of growth in this movie. It did not hurt it but for I, me. Go ahead. I will say this about the Gamora thing, because you guys are right. Like, she didn't really, throughout the course of the movie, you don't really see growth. But then once she has that moment with Nebula where she finally understands that, because when she says, like, you know, for me, it was about survival. I was just trying to survive. Like, I wasn't looking at you as a sister and everything like that. I wasn't looking at, you know, I was just trying to keep Thanos from killing me. I wasn't thinking about what he was doing to you. I was just trying to keep him from doing that shit to me. So she goes through that and, like, you see, like, a quick burst of growth after that at the the final, like, maybe 10 minutes. Because that's when she's finally able to look at Star-Lord and be like, yeah, we do kind of have that unspoken thing. When she's finally able to get out of that sense of, like, this is about us surviving and doing what we need to move forward and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can have a relationship. Maybe I can actually consider these people family and, like, connect with them and stuff like that. So it was kind of like a growth spurt for her. It wasn't, like, an overall growth throughout the course of the movie. This is like, you know, that one kid who was like five, who was like five, two for all of high school. And then like one summer he comes back and he's like six, seven. That was like the, for me, what Gamora's growth was in that movie. So like a quick, sudden burst at the end. And I hopefully go moving forward. We'll see more development from her. James Gunn had a chart on the board. He was like, okay, Gayandu check. Staldo doing his thing, check. We got Rocket Grove, check. Cause Drax from good, right? Yeah, I think we oh, got the Gamora. Yeah, exactly. Like, fuck, we got the Gamora. Let's do it right here, do it right here. But, um, <laughs> yeah, listen, man. I, that, that movie, seriously, is, is amazing, man. It is, fuck, I, I love it. I really do. I can't stop gushing about it. And the best fucking part of the whole fucking movie was... The cameo with Stan Lee and Uatu the Watcher. Holy crap, the fucking Watcher! You see the Watcher? Never in a million years would I have thought we'd have seen the Watcher. I've always wanted it. I would have loved to see maybe the Watcher's shadow or something when the Chitari invaded New York. Some creep. Never in a million years. And there was Stan Lee telling his stories from not only the Marvelverse, but across the spectrum, it seemed. I was like, yo... This is why I love James Gunn. He's so in Um and, and if this movie has given me faith in anything, is I have the utmost faith in where he is going to take the Marvel Cinematic Universe after um, the Infinity stuff. It's going to get there. He said Nebula is going to try to kill Thanos. We're, we're getting all of this. This is all coming down the pipe. And I... I am <laughs> beyond excited. So those are my final words. Matt, I'm going to give you some final words. Um, I think it's been pretty well summed up, actually. You know, fucking like 8.5, 9 out of 10, only because it's a little bit too long. Mm-hmm. That's fair. That is fair. Chris? Yeah, like, I agree. I agree. Because, like, you know, we touched on a little earlier some of the some of the things that kind of drew me out of it. So I'd give it a solid nine, nine out of ten. I love the, like you said, I love the the watcher scene and everything like that. And it does give me hope with James Gunn, because it really is like people have been talking about that on the internet for a while. Like, oh, what if he's a watcher? And that's why he keeps showing up in all these different things and everything like that. And James Gunn saw those fan theories. He's like, you know, fuck it, we're doing that. We're putting that in the movie. Fuck it. Um, I loved all the other little, you know, moments that they had in the um the after credit sequences. You know, Starhawk and the original Dope. Guardians and everything, the original Guardians team. Um, fucking the Adam Warlock spoiler. Like, you know, I shall call him Adam. James you Gunn know, went on so record. Many people on my screen and just stood up and clapped when they heard him call him Adam. And James Gunn went on record saying he's kind of upset with himself for putting the cocoon in the first Guardians movie. And that, and, and had to yeah, change exactly. it. Even though it th- that was like the cocoon in Infinity Gauntlet, the comic, the in the first guardians movie that that nasty insectoid looking cocoon where well, this one was yeah. pretty it, I, oh god i cannot wait for that shit. so i loved i love the stingers that i do i love that the credit singers that they did that do future world build thing i love the ones they did just for the fuck of it like teenage group was fucking hilarious hysterics to me. like a little sarcastic i am group i am group i am group like it's like <laughs> that she was hilarious to me uh, now i know how yandu felt like <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you, you guys were supposed to be my ride home. Like, all those little moments were hilarious to me. I, I, again, like, 
I know earlier on I said there were things that I didn't appreciate, and I don't want anyone walking away thinking that just because there were little moments that kind of like I do, eh, I could have done without this, or I could have done. I can't gush about this movie enough. Like, fuck the numbers, because I know that they're going back and forth. Like, is it doing as good as the first one? Is it going to do better? Fuck the numbers, fuck all that shit. This was just a fun, entertaining movie that I could connect with emotionally. This was all, this is going to go down as one of my all time favorites. Like, it's, it's broke my top 10. I have to reassess, like, I have to reassess all how all my other movies and everything and see where it fits into my top 10, but it's definitely in the top 10. Oh, I cannot wait for the top five. I can't wait to do the end of year review. It's going to be fun. We get to see where these movies pan out because there's a shit storm of movies still coming. But that will do it here for us today. Go check out Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. It is worth every single penny and it is worth your time to see it more than once. Like me. I'm probably going to go see it again at least two more times. Going to see it more than once. Yeah, so thank you, Chris, for joining us once again. No problem. Always a pleasure. And Matt, thank you once again. Of course. I'm always here. And thank you guys out there for hanging out with us, geeking out with us. And I'm G1. We out of here. Peace.